Hello, and welcome back to RimWorld, where me and my friends, Smoking Baby and Bad Luck, are trying to keep our families alive. Last time we found out how difficult that can be, as we endured animal attacks, mental breaks, and a lethal case of friendly fire. But I'm sure that was all just a blip, and we're about to move on to prosperity and happiness. To start things off, Smoking Baby allots some space to grow crops, which is a great idea, as lack of food has been a constant problem from the off. McIntyre gets planting, as Stephen recovers from getting shot by those pesky drug dealers last video, so we're off to a good start. I noticed that Alec is picking out on food. <sighs> Straight away with this guy. I don't know when this started, but it can't be helping the food situation much. It's not the end of the world though, it's not like he's killed someone. It's almost time to get some exterior walls up. We decide that we're going to start with a wooden palisade since we don't have many stone blocks. We'll need a lot more wood for this though, so we set a bunch of trees to be chopped down. Stephen and Alec decide they're competing for the title of most unstable colonist, as Alec stops gorging through our food just as Stephen starts having a tantrum. Bloody teenagers, it's always the same. They accidentally commit manslaughter or lose a sister, and it's all wine, wine, wine. Stephen spends some time kicking the Metal family house before escalating things and barging into Mila's room to trash the place. She doesn't take too kindly to this and arrests him immediately. Rather than throwing Stephen in jail though, she releases him into the Oxbridge house where he can only break his own family's stuff, which I think is fair enough. As soon as Mila releases Stephen, he makes a beeline for the Great Hall, where we keep our most valuable resources. Cohen manages to head him off and has a quiet word calming him down. Now that that's been dealt with, we put down a blueprint for the Palisades, and everyone rushes to get them built. It turns out the constant threat of getting eaten is the greatest motivator. Who knew? Some meat rots away in the freezer, reminding us that we've not got any electricity yet, which is a bit of an oversight. We build a small wood fire generator room nearby, and Squint eagerly fills it up, not realising that it's not actually hooked up to anything yet, and he's just burning our precious resources for no reason. But hey, at least he's enthusiastic. While the power cables are being built, Viper takes a crack at building us some chairs in the Great Hall, to go with our fancy tables, but he just ends up wasting more wood and leaving an embarrassment. Speaking of embarrassment, we're low on food again, so Henriette goes out to hunt a nearby turkey. Even though it's literally a turkey shoot, she is so inaccurate that Jason has to step in and deal with the turkey, Arnie style. The T-Rex is progressively getting closer, and is joined by a Daedon and a wolf, so now we have three threatening predators living just over the river from us. We discuss maybe trying to tame the T-Rex, which I'm all for until I realise it'd be Steven doing the taming, which, based on his history, wouldn't go very well. Besides, we've still not got much food, and adding another meat eater to the equation probably wouldn't help. In the end, we decide we're not going to tame the T-Rex, but the discussion does give us an idea. Early next morning, I send Kim out past the sleeping carnivores to one by one steal the bodies of their latest prey. Our plan is simple. We remove any source of food from near them so that they get so hungry that they have to kill each other off. In retrospect, having three starving predators just outside the colony is asking for trouble, but it honestly seemed like a good idea at the time. It's time to start expanding our minds, and more importantly, our wallets. So we plan out a research room and a market street respectively. One day soon, these shelves will be laden with goods for our many satisfied guests to buy. And I guess we'll have some new technology or something as well. The Palisade War's nearly done, so we start to look to the future and design what will become our northern expansion. We are, however, out of wood again, so continue our policy of mass deforestation. While our colonists are busy destroying the planet, Bad Luck puts forward a proposal to add another mod to the game. His chosen mod adds buildable windows, which is a nice idea and would certainly make our colony look a whole lot nicer, but we're already elbow deep in mods, and the more we add, the less stable the safe becomes, so me and Smoking Baby shoot down the idea. It does remind me of an interesting dream I had though, where I had to climb out of a window to escape a pack of sound dogs from Half-Life. This leads into a lengthy discussion on dreams and their meanings, which is actually really wholesome, until Bad Luck steers the conversation to genitals, which is kind of his default. Anyway, we noticed that a lot of our colonists are washing themselves in the nearby swamps, instead of the big clean river running through the centre of the map. And while the river is the better option, neither is ideal, so we endeavour to get the plumbing sorted as quickly as possible. We also decide to build a well in the meantime, but get distracted planning a town square for it to go in the centre of and don't actually get round to building the well itself. Oh well. The prehistoric predators we've been stealing food from have gotten hungry, and one of them decides to go after one of our dogs instead of fighting each other like we'd hoped, which actually makes perfect sense. We gather a posse and move to head it off. It gets enraged after getting shot by Henriette and she has to escape through a door back into the compound. Unfortunately, Alec leaves the door open a little bit too long, and the Daedon gets through and catches Henriette. Awkward. 
It gets a couple of hits on her before we manage to take it down, but luckily she manages to get away with only a couple of bruises. It's a good job it wasn't a T-Rex, I suppose. Both the research and tailoring benches are built now, so we can clothe our colonists, discover new technology, and hopefully make some money along the way. We decide our first research project is going to be sewage composting, as our latrines have been emptied, leaving us with well over a thousand faecal sludge. I don't actually know what metric this is measured in. Barrels? Liters? Either way, it's a whole lot of poop with nowhere to go. Some guests arrive, but we're a long way off having rooms ready for them, so we put down our old sleeping bags and hope they're not too fussy. We decide that we're not going to charge them for their stay, as the colony isn't a particularly pleasant place to visit at the moment, and we don't want them to give us a bad TripAdvisor review. Alec finally finishes the chairs in the Great Hall, whilst chatting to Viper about how easy it is building things, and how only an idiot wouldn't be able to build a chair. Pretty savage. Viper rightly takes this personally, and quickly responds by smashing out a second research bench. Good job, Viper. Alec feels a bit of a fool after this and decides to go hide in his room, while Jason and Kim intensely research how to put shit in a barrel and leave it. Our friend Milky comes online and asks if he can join us. We say the more the merrier, so he jumps onto the server. This is great, because not only is he a good dude, but now we have someone to blame all our mistakes on. Nice one, Milky. Way to take one for the team. Suddenly we're being raided. Oh god. Is this it? Is this how it ends? Why did you bring them here, Milky? They're coming at us from two different directions and they... Oh. oh there's only three of them. Okay, well, we still have to be careful, though. We don't want to lose anyone to any stupid mistakes. I send Steven to take out Sis, the raider with the Molotov cocktails in the north, as she has the capability of causing some damage. This doesn't go too well, though, as a combination of Steven being inept and Sis just tanking shots leads to Viper being a little bit set on fire. Before long, though, Sis is down, and the other two are dead. We've suffered no fatalities, but Viper is a little crispy, and Henriette took a bullet to the lung. But she's got another, so I'm sure she'll be fine. Kim gets ready to tend to the... hold on? Kim's a misogynist? What the hell, Kim? That's so fucked up. Anyway, Kim starts emergency surgery on Sis, but her wounds are unfortunately too great, and she bleeds out and dies. It's a real shame, as we were looking forward to brainwashing her into joining our colony. And I can't help but think that Kim would have tried harder if Sis was a man. Hmm, food for thought. Alec has decided to stop hiding in his room, conveniently now that all the fighting has stopped. But Steven's not looking too mentally healthy, so I'm sure we'll not have both of them operational for very long. Somehow, guns have ended up on Smoking Baby's clove shelves down Market Street, much to his annoyance. He naturally accuses Milky, who we all agree is definitely guilty. Bloody Milky, joining and changing things that ought not to be changed. We've got a delicate ecosystem here, you thoughtless jag. Milky pleads his innocence, saying that he's not had the opportunity to change anything since the raid happened immediately after he joined, which is actually a very good point. Bloody Milky, not changing or building anything. This is a team game, damn it. Get involved, you thoughtless jag. A new guest named Strike arrives, but we're too busy blaming Milky for stuff, so don't notice or put down a sleeping bag for him. There's plenty of warm indoor space though, so hopefully he'll find somewhere comfortable to sleep regardless. Henriette has developed an infection in her wounded lung, which is never a good thing. I send Kim over to take a look, but McIntyre insists on taking lead on this one. Fair enough, mate. It's your wife, after all. It's probably a good choice anyway, based on the last woman Kim treated. Kim goes as a bath next to a dead body instead, despite there being a vast amount of corpse-free river to wash in. This reminds us that we still need to build a well, but we quickly discover that we can't place it in the centre of town like we planned, as there's no water underneath it. And a well without water is just... well, it's just a holly duck for no reason. We end up placing it to the left of the square, which greatly upsets Bad Luck, but he ultimately decides that it's a better option than shifting the whole colony ten feet to the left, which I think is a good choice. It's at this point that we notice Strike. He's sleeping in the swamp where we've dumped all the dead raiders. Alright, strange choice there mate, but whatever. We've put down a sleeping bag for him, but there's nothing we can actually do to wake him up, so we've just got to leave him there to soak. We spend a bit of time chatting about how awful being a guest here would be right now. I mean, they have to wash in a freezing river, the bathrooms are so full of shit that they make a festival portal look hygienic, and they have to sleep in bags on the floor of a tiny dark room if they're lucky enough to get a space at all. We've got a long way to go before guests can be our primary source of income, but at least it's nicer than Firefest. Food is running low, so we set some wild boar to be hunted to extinction. Hopefully that'll last us until we start harvesting our crops. 
In some good news, Viper has fully recovered from his burns, and Henriette's lung infection is under control, so things are looking up for the Metal family. Strike is still asleep in the corpse swamp, which is a little concerning, and I noticed that one of our other guests, Marson, has been standing in a toilet cubicle for a very long time. In fact, I can tell you after reviewing the footage, that he stands there for a total of 8 hours, which I think we can all agree is a bit strange. After spending a full working day's worth of time in the bathroom, Marson then goes and sits on Squint's knee, staring him point blank in the face until he leaves. What a weirdo. That group of guests leave, just as the well is finished, and Strike finally wakes up and claims a sleeping bag. They were very disappointed with their stay, which genuinely surprises us, despite just having a conversation about how crap staying here would be. The upside of this, though, is that Marson probably won't be back anytime soon, so silver linings, I guess. It's time we started working on our industry, so bad luck starts the plans for a sweatshop. I mean, workshop. Stephen doesn't seem keen on this idea, and finally has the tantrum he's been threatening for a while. No one is surprised. We're still getting warnings about low food, but we've got a steady stream of cabbage and boar meat, so things aren't as dire as they first appear. Or at least we would have a steady stream of cabbage if Cohen would stop botching all the harvests. How does someone even fail at picking food so badly? Oh no! My bad. Ah, oh, bugger. Happened again. Whoops. Anyway, Stephen stops having a strop quicker than expected, and Harriet fully recovers from her lung infection, so things are looking up. You can tell that not much is happening, because Bad Luck starts lamenting the lack of windows in the workshop, and making penis jokes again. I'm pretty sure that the inside of his head is basically a George Formby film. The workshop is nearly finished, so it's time to start planning the hospital. It probably would have been sensible to build a hospital first, but we're capitalists, so the health and well-being of our colonists is secondary to our profit margin. We finish researching sewage composting, so move on to batteries for when Steven inevitably goes crazy and breaks the generator. We're nearly out of wood again though, so it's time to destroy some more nature. A wreckage explorer comes to visit, which I feel says a lot about the quality of our colony. She passes Strike, who is finally leaving. He didn't have a very nice time, but he spent the first two days sleeping in a freezing cold corpse swamp, so I think that's mostly on him. Another Deoden starts trying to eat one of our dogs again, but we deal with it a lot better this time, taking it in turns to kite it around. There's a bit of a dodgy moment where it chases Samantha through the nearly built workshop, but in the end we take it down without a single injury. Nice one boys. The next day, Henriette is out hunting caribou, when one doesn't take too kindly to being shot, charging across the swamp to try to gore her. It really hasn't been Henriette's week. Luckily, Jason and Steven are on hand to help take it down before it reaches her. Summer has begun, and I can't think of a better time to get the plumbing up and running, as latrines and heat are never a good mix. I plan out the Oxbridge bathrooms, and Alex starts piping everything up. We choose to put the sewage outlet pipe to the north of the bridge, as the river runs from the south and we don't want to play a constant, literal game of poo sticks. To finish off the session, Smoke and Baby fences off our grow fields, as he's tired of varmints eating our crops. At the same time, a stonecutter's bench gets built in a newly finished workshop, which will give us access to stone blocks, and hopefully stop us from deforesting the entire map. And so ends our second episode. No obituaries today, which is good, and hopefully we can keep that up next time. A big thank you to my friends, Smoke and Baby, Bad Luck and Milky, for letting me record and talk about them. And thank you for watching. Catch you next time.